there's a true story that comes from uh, the sinking of the Titanic in which a lady uh, was, as the ship was sinking, was being lowered into a lifeboat into the uh, ice cold waters. And at that moment she said that uh, she needed to retrieve something from her room. At that point they told her, you've got three minutes or we'll leave without you. And so she gets back onto this boat, which was already starting to shift, makes her way through the gambling room where money and things had piled up into one corner and was ankle deep. Runs through that, finds her way to her room, to where she opens uh, where her valuables are. And there inside this uh, vault or whatever she had, her jewelry, her expensive uh, earrings, her expensive necklaces, her diamond rings, and, uh, and she pushes all that aside and grabs three oranges and takes them with her, goes back to the boat and is able to make it in time. We read that and we hear that and we think what a, an incredible thing uh, to bypass all the, those expensive things for three oranges and I'm sure that you know, a few hours before that, she would have never thought of doing such a thing, would she? But there are events in life that really have the power to transform the way we think and how we look at the world. There are things that can happen in our life that can change our perspective, our values, things that were once uh, valuable to us suddenly become meaningless. And just the opposite. Especially when we're looking toward the end of our lives and we're, we're facing the, uh, the door of death and we realize what's really important in our lives. And those are the things that draw us. And those are the things, as I uh, many times have called to pay people's rooms in the hospital who are in fact dying. Most of the time, at least not with me, they don't want to talk about their bank account. And they don't want to talk about all those things. They want to talk about their soul. They want to make sure everything is right between them and God and between them and their family. Those are the things that are important to them. Jesus' parable, of, it's about a wedding. And it's really told from the vantage point, not of the bride and groom, but of the ten bridesmaids, or the ten virgins, as the King James says. And really, when it comes down to it, uh, let's just say out front that this is really about the second coming. Now, I've read a lot of commentaries uh, on this, and uh, many try to get around this to say, well, you know, it means this or that. But... When you get right down to it, there is, a, there is this element of judgment and then talking about the second coming. And it's really about, more than anything, about being ready, being prepared. And so Jesus' parables sometimes, uh, we, ended up, uh, we end up asking more questions than we have answers sometimes. Sometimes He leaves us hanging a little bit, and He doesn't always go ahead and explain what He means. Sometimes He does, and oftentimes He doesn't. And we don't always uh, able to understand every part of it, but he's usually got a, a point. So if we, if we look at this as an allegory, of which it is, each thing kind of represents something else. You know, and if you think the, the bride, of course, and the bridegroom, the bride being the church and the bridegroom being Christ, and then uh, the, the people in, in, in being taken to this uh, Bride's house and all this would represent the kingdom of God. All these things are representative of, of something. And so uh, I understand, I read uh, one commentary where it's, it's not uh, politically correct to say kingdom anymore. Kingdom of God. Uh, a new word they're suggesting is kingdom. Because kingdom is, uh, some say, outdated and, and, and it speaks of, uh, you know, kind of a patriarchal society of, of dominance and all that. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, I think you have to, in, in order to understand these parables, you have to understand the culture of the time. 
And I personally am not in favor of doing away with history in order to be politically correct. I, I believe we have to understand history in order to understand meaning and context. Now, you can do with that with what you will, but once you understand it, uh, and you understand history, and you understand it, for example, when you're trying to understand the Bible, we have a tendency to read the Bible with our modern American civilization mindset. And therefore, we interpret parables, we interpret Scripture from our white American perspective. And that's sometimes okay, but a lot of times it can get us in trouble because it wasn't written in that context. And so to understand many of these parables, you have to sort of understand the culture and the people who was being uh, uh, spoken to and who was writing the letter. And so this is a parable about a wedding. And it's not a typical wedding like we know in America. It was a Jewish wedding. And in those days, you know, in our weddings today, we set a time and a date and we know when it's supposed to ha be, take place. And we are, uh, you know, at that time we're, we know when we're supposed to be there. But in a Jewish wedding, it was a little different. They, uh, there was always an element of surprise to the wedding. And so what would happen was the, the bride would be at her house and the wedding party would be with her. And oftentimes the, the groom, uh, whatever he was doing before, whether he was partying or whatever, I don't know, but he would come to the bride's house at any given hour. Oftentimes it would be late, sometimes on purpose, because the element of surprise was always an extra mystical element. And so the bride would, would come to the house, but uh, in order not to, you know, to be fair, to be fair, the, the bridegroom would often send a uh, person in front of them who would shout, the bridegroom cometh, make yourself ready. And so everyone oftentimes, and in this case it was in the midnight hour, and it was a very late because you never knew when it was going to happen. Everyone was asleep, the five virgins and the five, uh, uh, the five foolish and the five wise. They were all asleep. But they heard the cry that the bridegroom cometh, make yourself ready. And sometimes, of course, uh, even in those days, they would uh, be some that would miss out because they wouldn't be ready or they wouldn't hear the cry. And, uh, and so these five virgins uh, that were wise got up and trimmed their lamps and they had prepared not only oil in the lamp, but they had extra oil and the others did not. And here I think uh, there's several things that, that we can say about this passage and some of the things that it teaches us today. Uh, and, and of course uh, being ready is one of those. But I think one of the things that we need to understand about, about this is that we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And if He doesn't come back when and how we think He should, we should be ready either way. And not only that, we should be expecting, but also anticipating the fact that it may not happen when we think it should. In other words, if the Lord delays His coming, that we're not going to be like the, uh, the, the story that Jesus talked about, the, the person who, uh, who said, well, my Lord has tarried His coming. I'll just go eat and drink and be merry. And then He comes. So, you know, we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of religions and a lot of people who have uh, announced that this is the day the Lord is coming back. And I, even some uh, evangelical people like Jack Van Impey and people have, have uh, pretty much set dates and said, you know, everything is lining up and this is when it's going to happen. And we've had people of different religions, including uh, Jehovah Witnesses and, and included some Christians who have who've set dates. I remember when I was in high school and uh, the book came out, uh, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come, Come Back in 88. And they had all these people who were stirred up about this. And then I remember the Y2K scare. Y'all remember that? And everybody was getting ready for the end of the world. And it didn't happen. Y'all remember the, the 
Heaven's Gates group and, and all these people. Remember the group that, that were looking for uh, them to be taken on the, on the planet on uh, Hellbop, the comet. That they, they all got ready and, and committed suicides and expecting to, to ride out on Hellbop. The problem with these kind of things is that when we get our expectations of something happening at a certain time in a certain place and it doesn't happen, we become disillusioned. And so I think today that one of the main things that Jesus is trying to get a point is that we don't know. I've seen so many people try to say, well, you know, the Lord's getting ready to come back. Well, maybe He is, but we don't know. And you can get into all kinds of theologies about the rapture. And, and you know, I'm not convinced that, you know, that is even a biblical theology. I, I, I believe that Jesus is coming back. I don't know when. I just know He is. And, you know, there's been so many different people who said, you know, well, are you pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? What? I just believe, I, I guess I'm one of those uh, uh, pan-tribs. I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. I believe Jesus is coming back, and I don't know when. And so, it behooves us to be ready when He does. And so, here we have this picture of the bridegroom coming in the midnight hour, and the cry goes out, the bridegroom cometh. And the question is, are you going to be ready when that happens, in the midnight hour? And for the midnight hour for you may be when we close our eyes in death. You see, some people are looking for the rapture. They're looking for some great event. And the truth is, uh, you know, uh, John, John Chafin used to say this all the time. He said, when, when Jesus calls your name and when you close your eyes in, de eyes in death, that is Jesus coming for you. That's it. And so... Let me give you a, a few things, three things here that I think that are, are worth noting here and that I think that we can learn from this lesson. And the first is this. There are some things in life that cannot be borrowed. There are just some things that we cannot borrow. Now, you know, usually uh, when we read a story in the Bible, uh, you know, it talks about loving one another and sharing our goods with one another and all this. And here's a case where uh, Jesus almost commends a group of people for not sharing. And it doesn't make sense sometimes in our, in our uh, understanding. But there are some things in life that cannot be borrowed. They did not share because they could not share. And when it comes to salvation and faith, those are things that I can't give you. And you cannot give me. You can't, the old preacher said, you can't get to he heaven on the coattail of mommy and daddy. It just don't work that way. We can't expect that because somebody else has faith that we have faith as well. The Holy Spirit, salvation, faith, these are things that cannot be shared and borrowed. Now we can encourage one another and we can uh, propel one another to good works and all this. But when it comes to it, the old song says you've got to walk this lonesome valley. You've got to walk it for yourself. Ain't nobody can walk it for you. You've got to walk it by yourself. I used to not understand, but I think I, think I know a little bit what he's talking about here. That, that there are some things that we have to do for ourselves. That, you know, we're going to stand for God on our own. I'm not going to give an account for what you did. You know, I, I'm not going to have to answer for what you did. The Bible says I will stand and give an account for one person only, and that's me. You will stand and give an account for one person only, and that's you. And by the way, I'm not going to be your judge, and you're not going to be mine. We will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things done in this body, whether good or bad. And so, when we stand before God someday, we will stand there based upon what we have done and not what anyone else has done. And we can't expect that because mom and dad, you know, were Christians, that we automatically know Christ. It, it's an individual thing. We all have to make our faith. And, you know, in, in the Methodist Church, I, I like the fact that we have confirmation. Some people don't understand what confirmation is all about. But in the Methodist Church, we do sometimes have babies that are in, infants that are baptized. But we understand that that doesn't say that they're saved. That that's not making them Christians. 
that we are simply doing this sort of like a dedication that we're saying by that, that we are giving this child to God. And that grace that goes before, provenient grace, will continue to be with this child. Until such a time, that child will make a decision. And we as a church are going to get behind this child and as a family and as parents, and we're going to support them and lead them. But there comes a time when we have to let go and let God, and they have to make their own decision. You know, there comes a time in all of our lives. It came in my life. You know, I grew up in a family with mixed spiritual values, but my mom was a Christian, took me to Sunday school and church, and I, I understood that. But there come a point in my life where I drifted from that, and I, I actually rebelled against that. And I become almost, uh, I would probably describe sort of an agnostic at, at one point. And I guess it was a point in my life where I was just questioning everything that I had been taught. But it wasn't until God began to deal directly with me, and I at some point had to make the decision on, by myself that this is the God that I'm going to trust. And I may not have accepted everything that I was taught, but I accepted Jesus for myself. And I, and I asked Him to come into my life. And so confirmation is just that. It's that that same grace that's been with you is the same grace that you confirm in your life. And there comes a point in your life where we all have to do that. We have to accept it or confirm it for ourselves. And say that, you know, this thing that I've been taught and, and, and I've, you know, I've, I've understood from a child, is this real? Is this God that I've heard about? Is this real? And we have to make a decision. Uh, I, parents, we, we want to be able to, to do those things and make the decisions for our children. But there comes a point where it's really a, a, an individual thing. We understand that. They can't borrow our faith and our salvation. You can't live on someone else's oil. You just can't do it. You have to have your own. And that's what the virgins learned in this story is that they were not prepared. That, you know, they had enough oil. It wasn't that the fact that they fell asleep because they all fell asleep. And we all do sometimes. It wasn't the fact that they didn't have oil in their lamps. They all had oil in their lamps. The problem was they didn't have enough. And they weren't prepared that the coming of the bridegroom might be delayed longer than they thought. And they just weren't ready for that. And so you can't borrow someone else's oil. Secondly, I think that the parable suggests that there are some things that cannot be put off until the last moment. There are just some things that are so important. We can't wait to tomorrow to take care of. We need to make sure. The Bible says, today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. And we hear those words and we understand that what the writer is saying is that this is so important. It's too important to put off until tomorrow. Today is the day. And we need to understand that there are some things that we just cannot wait until tomorrow. We have a tendency, some of us, to procrastinate. And we have a tendency to put things off on the back burner and they can pile up on us. But there are just some things that we have to just take care of today. Oh, that old song that talks about uh, almost persuaded. Why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? You know, because we oftentimes think maybe tomorrow, but we know that tomorrow may never come. And those things that we want to do and we think we should do or we know we should do need to be done. We need to make sure that we take care of those things today. Somebody says, well, I'm going to, one of these days I'm going to, I'm going to make a will. Or some, one of these days I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. One of these days I'm going to get right with God. But there's been a lot of people who've made that statement that tomorrow will never come for them. So today is the day. The Bible doesn't promise us a tomorrow other than the fact that we have to make preparations today. So we can't put off some things to the last moment. And number three, 
the parable suggests to us that if we are not prepared, uh, we can miss some great opportunities. In other words, the door of opportunity will eventually close. Now, I have to tell you that there, there is an element of judgment to this parable. And again, uh, you know, I, I've read commentaries where, you know, they try to get around that and make it about something else and what it is. But you can't read this without understanding that there is an element of judgment to this. And the Bible says that, that they came to the door and the door was closed. And they cried out, let us in. And the bridegroom's attendants said, I'm sorry, we don't know you. And what a, what a sad, sad thing to think about the fact that, that we could bank put all of our, uh, our hopes in the fact that, you know, we're going to put something off until tomorrow. And that we, uh, that the door will always be open. And it reminds us of the uh, Noah's Ark. You know, all the preaching that went on for hundreds of years. What was it, 120 years that, that he preached? And, you know, plenty of opportunities. People had plenty of opportunities, just like today. Opportunities abound. But yet there is a time when that door will be closed. There is a time and there is a point in life when that door is closed. And it's too late. Um, and, and again, you know, as we think of this, these are metaphors. These are metaphors for God's judgment. And you can't read this with any other way other than to say that there is a time. You know, and, and it doesn't mean that God's a mean God. It means that God is giving every, every opportunity that He can. And we have the opportunities all around us. You can't drive very far without seeing a church building or hearing, a, you know, turning on the news or whatever and hearing that there, you know, that God is all around us. You know, uh, you could just walk out in nature and see God's display, His handiwork displayed. So that there is no excuse, the Bible says. The opportunities abound for sure. But the Bible says that at midnight there was a cry. Behold the bridegroom cometh. Come and meet him. The midnight cry. I don't know when that will be. But midnight suggests that it's a little longer than maybe we had anticipated. But it also suggests that it, we don't know when it's going to happen. It may happen at midnight. It may happen in the morning. The point is... There's going to be a, that cry. And the Bible says that every eye will see Him. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a time when we will hear that cry. And again, the old song, one of the first songs I learned to sing was Old Sinner Man. Run, it's old spiritual. Run to the rocks. <clears throat> the rock is a melting. Run to the rock. The rock is a melting. All on that day. Run to the sea. The sea is a bowling. Run to the sea. The sea was a bowling. I ran to the sea. The sea was a bowling. All on that day. Old sinner man, where are you going to run to? Old sinner man, where are you going to run to? Old sinner man, where are you going to run to? All on that day. Run to the moon, the moon is a bleeding. Run to the moon, the moon is a bleeding. Run to the moon, the moon is a bleeding all on that day. Old sinner man, you should have been a praying. Old sinner man, you should have been a praying. Old sinner man, you should have been a praying all on that day. So the midnight cry, when it happens, the question is, are you making preparation today to be ready tomorrow. As the musicians come, let us pray. Dear Lord, we don't say these words callously or, Lord, with any kind of uh, anxiousness other than knowing, God, that 
there are many people in this world who are banking on the possibility of a tomorrow and a tomorrow that may never come. And I want to pray, Father, that you would help us to make preparations today for tomorrow. Amen. The invitation is open if anybody would like to come. And if anybody is watching and want to pray, we invite you to do so. You know, the easiest thing in the world is just to get saved. It's just a matter of saying yes. Somebody gives you a present, you reach out and you accept it, it's yours. But if you don't accept it, if you refuse it, it's not yours. God won't force salvation on anybody, but He offers it to everybody. Amen? And so all you have to do is say yes. Hear the benediction. Go out among the outcasts and grieving, and speak the word of life and hope, and may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. amen.